All right. Good evening. Welcome back tonight. Welcome to the uh, second week of Discipleship Month. Everybody doing all right? Fantastic. I'm glad to see folks coming back tonight. Uh, I guess one question that I would ask you is after you uh, thought about what it means to be Baptist last week and what it means to have Baptist as our church's middle name, uh, did you experience church differently or think about church differently uh, because of some of the things we talked about last week? Okay, for my sake, for the folks at home, they all said yes. That may not necessarily be true. Uh, but we're going to continue to talk about what it means to be a Baptist church. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, question uh, that is, who's in charge here? Uh, another way to ask that question is, says who? Uh, because that's really a question that we run into in life every once in a while. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity, again, to gather together and think about uh, the heritage that you've given to us. Lord, help us as we think through this to value and honor uh, some of our past, but Lord, to be challenged once again to make sure that we're rooted in your name through your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means to be part of a local church congregation a little bit better uh, by our time together tonight. We pray this in your name. Amen. This is the question uh, that we're going to deal with tonight, and that is, who is in charge? Because uh, there's a lot of different things, that you, a lot of different answers in terms of who is in charge. You have different people in charge at work. You have different people who are in charge at home. And sometimes one of the reasons why church can sometimes be a difficult place where sometimes folks don't always get along and folks kind of have a little bit of conflict every once in a while is because there is a debate about who is supposed to be in charge in that place. And so I want us to spend a little bit of time trying to answer the question that inside of a Baptist church, who is in charge? Um, so it's really a question of authority this evening, and we talked about this a little bit uh, last Wednesday night when we talked about different sources of authority inside the life of the church. Uh, the first one is Scripture. Remember, we had uh, the tree and we had the roots of the tree where Jesus, as He was revealed through Scripture, and that's the foundation. And we said that what we really, really want is that we want to be the kind of church that is rooted in Scripture and that that is the answer and the authority for everything that we do. Uh, but the truth is, there's also some other sources of authority that happen inside of the life of a church. Uh, the word that I use here this evening is the word hierarchy, uh, which is Greek for the big bosses, uh, the people who are above. And sometimes you will see a organizational chart where you have uh, this group of people and they have a boss who's here and then that group of people have a boss who's here and it goes all the way up until there is a boss all the way at the top. And humanly speaking, there are some churches that are structured that there is a hierarchy to those churches. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, like a district superintendent. Uh, sometimes they're called a bishop or an archbishop uh, or a cardinal or a pope, all of those titles like that are, are moving up to a hierarchy that says, listen, this person has authority because they have this title, and the structure of the church is that these titles outrank these people and these people, and it goes all the way up until there's someone at the top of that human uh, hierarchy. Um, and so what you have is that there's scripture, but there's also what does the big boss say? Um, I don't mean to pick entirely, and I don't mean to use the word pick entirely on the Catholic Church, but they are the example, the most known example of hierarchy, because you have a bishop, and then you have, um, you have a priest, and the bishop, and an archbishop, uh, and there's titles all the way up, and still you, you have someone who's the top of that hierarchy that's called the pope, uh, the the 
the Bishop of Rome. And still, when he says something, it's in the news because he is the top of the hierarchy. And so when he speaks something, it's important because it is something that is speaking and covers the authority of a great number of people. And so that's regardless of value to that, that's just a reality that happens inside of a church. Um, Another source of authority is what I would call the accumulated teachings and practice over time. Uh, We talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, We called it uh, tradition. Uh, Some of those traditions are such things as that's the way that we've always done it, But another part of those traditions is this is a, this is the way this question has been answered for hundreds of years. Uh, This is the way that we've taught this item. And so it, it is not just this moment starting from scratch trying to answer this, but we go back and we look at the accumulated teachings and practices, um, What happens here is that sometimes systems can become substitutes. Now, what I mean by this is that there is a danger and there is a trap door to tradition in the life of every church. Basically, the first time a church or a person does something well, they do something right, then the trap door is let's do it just that way next time. And it works. It's effective. But sometimes if you just keep doing it the same way, then the system or the routine replaces the actual point that you were trying to make in there. We see this repetitively in almost every religious system. Uh, We see this in Judaism where there is the law of God that is given to us But then there becomes this outer shell of protective laws. So much of the things that Jesus is working against in the Gospels is these extra layers that were designed to protect and to teach the law, but they become a substitute for the Word of God. So the the Jewish faith falls into that on occasion. Uh, Sometimes when we looked at that tree, uh, the folks up that tree one of the reasons why there is separation is that because all of that trunk sometimes becomes more tradition than it is Scripture. But again, as I said last week, we have to be careful that we don't develop more and more traditions in our own church because there is just always that comfort level uh, to go in that. So those are the three different sources of authority. Why do we do the things that we do? Because Scripture teaches it. Because there is a boss or an authority figure that says this is the way that it's going to be. Or it's the accumulated teachings of history. Now again, I don't want this to be overly negative because there are some things that are really useful some solutions, some problems, some teachings that have been taught and say, you know what, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Go back and learn what's been taught. But we can't allow too many layers of that tradition that separates us from Scripture. Even when we find something that's part of our tradition, we need to be able to draw the line back to Scripture very quickly so that we keep a connection between the tradition and the uh, Scripture. A couple things about a Baptist church. Again, we said last week that a Baptist church has at its goal for Scripture to be its ultimate authority. So we would say that we do not have our authority in tradition, and we do not have our authority in a hierarchy. Our authority comes from Scripture. Because of that, we believe that every Baptist church is an independent congregation. So who's in charge? Well, this church is in charge. We have some decisions that we're going to be making in the life of this church in the next month, uh, some things about some things we want to do around the building and some things like that. Uh, And in order to do that, this church is going to vote on whether we make this decision or whether we go this direction or what we do because this church is independent. There is no hierarchy. 
There is no individual from outside of this church that can come to this church and say, this is what we're going to do. We are an independent uh, congregation. Our church chooses its own doctrine. We are not forced to teach, believe any doctrine by any outside force. We, again, want to find that doctrine inside of Scripture, but we don't, that's not coming to us from any other place. We choose our own doctrine. We choose our own leaders. Uh, some of you were here when I was called as a pastor. Uh, that was a decision that this church made by itself. Nobody said, this is the person who has to be your pastor or this is the person who's assigned to you. The members of this church determined who their next pastor was going to be. Uh, we choose our own future as much as we have the ability to do that. Uh, in 1999, this church used to be on the other side of town. They decided together that they would buy the property here and move the building move the church to right here. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission for that. That was the decision of this local church. A Baptist church is an independent congregation. The local churches express what they call congregational rule that's based on the priesthood of the believer. What we have is what we call congregational rule. Who makes the decisions in the life of the church? It's the congregation that does it. Now, the reason why we say that the congregation does it and not the hierarchy, not the traditions, but what we call the priesthood of the believer, and that is that every single person who is a believer in Christ has equal access to hear the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Every single person has equal access before God. So a pastor or a priest or a bishop or anyone like that, has no head start to listening to the Holy Spirit or listening to the leadership of God. And so because of that, I'm not more spiritual. I don't have more access to what God wants our church to do than any of you do. My voice does not count. I don't get to vote more than once when we make a decision together. I get a vote. If you're a member of the church, you get a vote, and we make this decision together. And that's a pretty big deal, that the congregation decides for itself who the pastor is going to be, what we're going to do about property, whether we're going to do church on Saturday nights, or whatever decisions in front of us, the congregation gets to do that because we believe that every single believer has equal access to God. Now, Here's where it gets a little bit, I don't know if the word's tricky, but this is really important. The church should choose discernment over democracy. The church should choose discernment over democracy. Here's what happens sometimes in the life of a church is that congregational rule means that all of the believers who are members of the church vote on the big decisions in the life of the church. And somehow, in some way, there is a combining of our idea of American democracy and voting rights with this idea of the priesthood of the believer and the congregation making its own decisions. Now, the distinction that I'm making here in terms of discernment over democracy is we need together to determine and understand what God wants for us to do versus what I want. Democracy says, I'm going to vote on what my opinion is. Effective democracy says, I'm going to get a bunch of my friends to vote with me as well. But the whole point of every person having equal access to the Spirit of God is that we have this incredible blessing that when we come to make big decisions, it's not just you saying, I wonder what God wants us to do. It's not just your pastor saying, I wonder what God wants us to do, but it is the gathering of 20, 30, 100, 200, 300 other believers in Christ 
praying together and saying, what is it that God wants us to do? Now, a couple of us might get it wrong. A couple of us might have something that's just kind of out of whack in our own spirit so that that what we're trying to hear from God is actually hearing from ourselves more than anything else. But the hope is that the church will be healthy enough so that we gather a bunch of us together and say, what is it that God would have us to do as revealed through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God? The hope is that 85%, 90% of us are going to be able to clearly hear what the leadership of God is. But we'll talk in a couple of weeks about some areas that Baptist churches could do better. This is one that I think Baptist churches could do better. Because we spend time voting on all the big decisions in the church, it, it, it runs to this glorification of democracy and convincing people to vote with you rather than thinking quietly, what is it that God wants for our church? So we're independent. We choose our own doctrine, our own leaders, our own future. It's congregational rule because of the priesthood of the believer. But don't confuse that. With democracy, every man has a vote. Every person has the obligation to prayerfully listen to the Spirit of God in terms of leading of our church. Uh, Now, we said that every Baptist church is an independent Baptist church, but we are also a connected Baptist church. Let's talk about what some of those connections are. There's a phrase that Baptists, other people use this in other contexts, but there's a phrase that they taught me in seminary way back in the day that says, Baptists are a rope of sand. You know what that means when they they describe that rope of sand? Is that you can kind of look at it on the ground there, and it is this rope that goes all the way along. But if you try to pick it up, what you're going to find is millions of little pieces of sand that aren't really connected. They look connected. Sometimes they can function connected because they are right next to each other, but they're not forcefully uh, connected. Our connections, because we're an independent Baptist church, are a rope of sand. We are connected, but there's no physical glue that holds us together. Let's talk about some of those connections. Uh, Our church is connected to a local association of churches. Uh, In our case, the local association of churches, and this is usually geographic, it's usually fairly close. Uh, This is the North Shore Baptist Association. In our case, this association of churches runs across the North Shore, that's right. You're smarter than you think you are. You, you, you know these answers. Uh, in fact, the, the, the church that's furthest away are a couple of churches that are in Slidell. And uh, we are really on the edges of that North Shore. There's a couple churches in uh, Pumpkin Center uh, that are just beyond us. But basically, that's our association of churches on the North Shore of uh, the lake. Uh, there, there's probably about 50 or 60 of those churches. We share common doctrine. We're going to get to that in a minute. But those are other Baptist churches that are part of this area regionally. Uh, We have what we call an associational strategist. This is a person that helps our churches to think more strategically about the work that we have to do. Uh, His name is Don Pusick. He preached for us one time uh, last year. Remember, he grew up in Arkansas, and he had some pictures of his family and things like that. Don's going to preach for us again in a couple of months. Uh, He's on the calendar uh, plan for that to happen as well. But that's our association uh, of churches. Uh, So First Baptist Hammond is part of that. First Baptist Church. Church Poncha, Poncha Tula. Uh, Trinity is part of that church. First Baptist Church Covington is part uh, of that association of churches. We're also voluntarily part of a regional convention. Usually that regional convention is connected with your state. Now there are some parts of the United States where there aren't as many 
uh, Southern Baptist churches, such as New England. New England is its own convention of churches. It's the New England Baptist Convention. There's some other places probably in the Northwest where, again, that's not populated by a ton of Southern Baptists, so they gather together regionally. But for us, it's our state convention. The state convention headquarters is in Alexandria, and they help us with some training. Uh, They help us uh, with some missions here in the state of Louisiana. Uh, They operate the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. Uh, That's our Louisiana Baptist uh, convention. Convention. Basically, when you join your local association of churches, then you automatically become part of the state convention. Now, some of this you have to understand from a time period a couple of centuries ago when relationships were really, really valuable. And so when you were out on the prairie or a distant someplace, You wanted to know that there were some other folks like you, and so you would gather together with some other folks like you every once in a while. And back in the day, this local association was the most important of all of the connections that happened. Uh, The next thing is that we have a national convention of churches. Uh, In our case, it's called the Southern Baptist Convention. There are some other national conventions of Baptist churches. The one that we're connected with is called the Southern Baptist Convention. Back in the day, the local association was the most important of these three connections. Today, the Southern Baptist Convention is the one that's most visible to our lives. That's the one that gets in the news every once in a while. In many ways, though, our local association still remains our most important connection. The Southern Baptist Convention is about 40,000 churches across the United States. Technically, the Southern Baptist Convention only exists for three days in June when they have their annual meeting. And it's, it's a really big deal. Uh, at times, it got as many as 50,000 people in a room to do church and, and to do business meeting. Uh, of church, and they gather together for those three days and make decisions about how they're going to use the resources of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, The Southern Baptist Convention every year uh, does a couple of things. They elect the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. That president will appoint different committees that will help populate things. Sometimes, just like any time there's an election, you got team A versus team B. And sometimes uh, this past year was a year that there was a lot of Team A and a lot of Team B. Uh, And that happens. That the person who gets elected gets to appoint those committees, and those committees really do have influence. But sometimes we come back from that meeting, and the media likes to cover all the things that the Southern Baptist Convention talks about. And they'll say, Back in the day, they said, Southern Baptists are going to boycott Disney World because we don't like the things that Disney is doing. And so they think, does that mean that every Baptist can't go to Disney World or watch ESPN? The answer to that is no, because we are an independent church, and what they talked about is just the opinion of the people who are in that room that day. It has no authority on our lives. And so every June, they'll have all kinds of conversations there. Sometimes they'll end up in the news, and your friends will say, are you one of those Southern Baptists? Didn't they just say such and such? Yes, they might have said that. But that does not have trickle-down authority on our church. Um, Let's see here what else we have here. Now, there are some Baptist churches that choose to have no formal relationships with other churches. Like I said, there are other Baptist uh, conventions. Uh, there's the National Baptist uh, Convention. Um, there, there are a couple other. Uh, my, my people way back in the day were part of a group called the General American regular Baptists. They were up north, but it was a different kind of a Baptist uh, convention. But you also have some churches that are called independent Baptist churches. Sometimes they're called landmark Baptist churches. And now those churches, they don't belong to an association. They don't belong to a state convention. They don't belong to a national convention. They don't even have a rope of sand. They're, They're very clear, like, it's just us. Now, sometimes they look at us and think, oh, you're being bossed around by these people. We're not. We, we, 
work with these folks in, in some things. But So all Baptist churches are independent. We choose to connect with these agencies. Some churches choose not to connect with any agencies, any other groups. They're like, it's just us. Um, okay, if we are the rope of sand and we're not forcefully held together in any way, what does connect us? Well, our history connects us. Remember the story that we told last week about the beginning of Baptist in 1607? That's, that's all of our story. That's, that's where we came from. We experienced the same backtracking on our understanding of the Word of God and our experience. In fact, there are several dates that are important. Um, there's not a quiz on this, but this just, you know, there are dates here. But 1607, we, we, we share the beginning of Baptist uh, history. 1845 is when we share the beginning of the Southern Baptist Convention. We're going to come back and talk about the beginning of the Southern Baptist Convention uh, in two weeks' time, but that's a, that's a significant date uh, that we share. 1925, again, these are like, wow, that's almost 100 years ago and all that, but 1925 is when the Southern Baptist Convention did two different things. One, they voted on a document that described the doctrine and the teaching of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, really one of the first times that they said, this is our official teaching document. And then the other thing that happened in 1925 is that they put together a funding strategy that says this is how we're going to share the resources of our convention to do the work of our convention. And that things called the cooperative program, and we still are participants in the cooperative program. The cooperative program said that these are a list of ministries, and we're going to get to those in a minute, but these are a list of ministries that our convention does together. Now, what they used to do is that they used to have this person would come and raise funds at your church, then the next person would come and raise funds at your church, and then the next person would come and raise funds at your church. But that process was, first of all, the church was almost under attack by people with their hand out all of the time. Some of those ministries raised more money than others because they had a really great speaker, not because the ministry was more important, and sometimes it just wasn't fairly distributed. The cooperative program says, this is the split on how we're going to do ministry. We're going to put all of our offering in one place and we'll distribute that offering as it goes. It's almost uh, kind of like the United Way does uh, for community uh, outreaches. Um, so our church gives 10% of everything that you give on a Sunday morning goes to the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention. That's a program that's been happening uh, since 1925. Every year this church has existed, every Sunday, every offering that this church has ever taken, about 10% of it goes to the ministries of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. It's a good number for us because what it means that while we encourage you to tithe out of your resources to the ministry of this church, our church tithes what you've given us to the ministries outside uh, of this church. And so 1925 is a, is a big deal, a date. It's part of our shared history. 1979 is another big deal. Uh, Inside of the politics of the Southern Baptist Convention, there was a concern in the mid to late 70s that we weren't being as grounded on the Word of God as we needed to be. And so all of those elections that we talked about, that they elect the president of the Southern Baptist Convention and he appoints these committees that, that kind of administer all the different ministries and parts of the Southern Baptist Convention, they began to say, we're going to make sure that people who are really founded on the Word of God win those elections. And so when they had 50,000 people, it's when they were really voting on this stuff hot and heavy. They called this the conservative resurgence, and that's when they kind of said, we're going to make sure that going forward, we're going to be grounded 
and I'm believing the Word of God. And so 1979 is a big day, but that's just part of some of our history that uh, connects us. Um, there's a sense of geography that connects us. Uh, we are the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, again, we'll get into some of that history uh, in a couple of weeks, but basically for a long time, the bulk of Southern Baptist churches are across the South. There are Baptist churches now in every single state of the Union, but the most Baptist churches are right here along the southern uh, states. That proximity means that we have a lot in common with some of those other churches. That they worship like us because they're, the rest of their lives are like us. And so we're connected to them because we're just some of the same folks. Um, we're also connected by doctrine. I told you that the other thing that happened in 1925 was that they approved what they call the Baptist faith and message. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been revised a couple times uh, since 1925, uh, but this is a description of what most Baptists believe. And I've got a copy up here that all of you can take this home. Now, this is an interesting document because it's a good document but there's a little bit of a difference in how we do our document. Sometimes you'll have what some people call a creed, and they will say, here's the list of things that you have to believe if you're going to be in good standing. This is what we call a confession. And the difference is that a creed tells you what you have to believe. The confession looks at a group of Baptists and instead of giving them a dot that they have to hit, it draws a circle around what most Baptists believe. So this describes rather than prescribes. It says, you know, if you want to know Baptists, this is what they believe. Not every Baptist, not every time, not every church, not every circumstance. But this is trying to draw the circle as closely around where Baptists are. One of the things that's distinctive about this is that there are some places where there's some doctrine that we don't always agree about, and this document gets quiet in those places. Sometimes a creed might go more specific in that place because it wants to really hammer out the details on this. A lot of people have questions about this. Let's go deep in this place. Here, sometimes it gets to those hard places, and it kind of mumbles because it knows that there's lots of Baptists, and they don't always agree they don't always agree on that point. So this is really drawing a circle around Baptists, not pointing to a dot that Baptists have to go to. But it's a good document to understand that. But it's, it's just a little bit of a difference there. Does that make sense? Uh, that doctrine, uh, but again, that's what connects us. That doctrine, that document says that we believe a lot of the same things. Uh, and sometimes those things are different than what the Presbyterians or the Methodists or the Catholics or, or some other group might believe that makes us unique, the Baptist faith and message. Um, our organizational, organizational structure connects us, and this is what we've been talking a little bit about, that associational life, the Louisiana Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention. We are connected to those things, um, so we're there. Th this is the one that's really, really important. It's our missions cooperation. All the way back from 1845, really all the way back to like 1813, there's another event in there that's a really big deal. Um, Baptists connected with one another so that they can be more effective in, in doing ministry. That, that's the reason why we're part of an association. That's the reason we're part of a state convention. That's the reason why we're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. The number's a little bit lower today than they used to be. Uh, but in the last, we, I think we have about 3,500 uh, international missionaries around the world. Uh, it used to be closer to 5,000, but the number's a little bit lower today. Uh, we have about 2,000 North American missionaries, uh, folks that are serving in North America or in uh, Canada and the United States. These are folks that are full-time doing ministry around the world, and they happen, it's 
possible because of the work and the contributions that we give through our cooperative program uh, dollars. Um, it's the International Mission Board. It's the North American Mission Board. Again, we've talked about uh, lately uh, disaster relief. Now, there's a lot of parts of Southern Baptist Convention that don't really know disaster relief because they didn't live in a place where there's disasters every year. Uh, but we know disaster relief really, really well. And that's not really true because people have got uh, tornadoes that come through the Midwest. There's flooding. So there's lots of parts around the world that have different, or the United States that have different disaster relief. And even the folks that live in a place where they may not have the disasters, they send folks to help in those disasters. And so this is a really important part of what makes us Southern Baptist and our connectedness is because we have chosen to partner and multiply our resources to be more effective in missions around the world. But there's a, another thing that connects us, and that is common experiences. Uh, sometimes you won't see this on a list, but I think this is really, really important. Uh, there are some common experiences. Uh, Lifeway curriculum is the Sunday school material that you use every Sunday. Uh, before it was called Lifeway, it was called the Baptist Sunday School Board. Uh, they changed the name so that they could sell it to people who weren't just Baptists. But it was the Baptist Sunday School Board that goes all the way back 150 years. They write the same curriculum. And back in the day, every Baptist church used the Baptist Sunday School Board Sunday School curriculum. Over a period of time, the Sunday School Board or Lifeway started to offer three different kinds of curriculum. Inside of our church, we, we use two of those. Uh, one is called Bible Studies for Life. Is that what you use, Ed? Explore the Bible is what you use. Explore the Bible has a six-year cycle that they will study every single book of the Bible. Uh, it's kind of a deep Bible study. And so several of our Sunday school classes are studying Explore the Bible. And if you were to go on vacation and go to Sunday school at a church, at a Southern Baptist church in Wyoming, there's a real possibility that they are also studying the Explore the Bible curriculum. And you can take your Sunday school book from our church and go to that church and use the same Sunday school book. There's another one that's called uh, Bible Studies for Life. It's a little bit more topical. It's a little bit more short-term uh, studies. But again, particularly back in the day, you could interchange with any other Baptist church and you'd be studying the same curriculum that you'd be studying here in that place. That has influence on our churches and it connects us. Um, this one, again, doesn't resonate as much as it used to, but there was a Baptist hymnal, uh, the, the songbook that we would use that would be published by the old Baptist Sunday School Board. And again, if you went from one church to another Baptist church when you were traveling around vacation, they would be singing the same songs out of the same hymnal. And it connected us. There was a, man, I used to know the dates of all the hymnals. There was a 1975 hymnal. There was a 1991 uh, hymnal. There was a, uh, I used to know all the names of the hymnal because there was just a handful of them. And you could, you could tell something about the church. It was like, well, which hymnal are they using? Are they using the uh, 63 hymnal? Are they using the 75 hymnal? Are they using the 91 hymnal? And I think there was one in the 2000s as well. You could tell whether the church was kind of rooted in the old hymnal or whether they wanted to go to the new hymnal. But that shared Baptist experience through the hymnal was a big deal. Um, Southern Baptists have six different seminaries. Uh, there's, uh, there's one in New Orleans, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. There's one in Fort Worth, Texas. There is one in Wake Forest, North Carolina. There's one in Louisville, Kentucky. There's one in Kansas City, Missouri. Where is it Kansas? It's in Kansas City. It's, it's there on the map. You can find it. Uh, and there's one out in the uh, Golden Gate region uh, out in California as well. So many pastors are being trained not from 50 different schools, but from six different schools. And so not every pastor is a graduate of one of these seminaries, but many, many are. And that's a unifying experience. It's a unifying teaching uh, thing. Uh, we have camps and retreat centers. Uh, 
the Southern Baptist Convention for a long time owned two big national convention centers, uh, campgrounds. One was in North Carolina. It was called Ridgecrest. One was in uh, Glorieta, New Mexico. They've actually sold both of those because they're really expensive to maintain and, and they needed to convert it as an income instead of an outgo. But man, if you talk to some old time Baptists, they will tell you about the time they went to Ridgecrest or about the times that they would go to Glorietta as a shared experience. Uh, today, our kids go to Southern Baptist camps. They will go to either Missions Fuge or Centrifuge or Center Kids. Those are all Baptist camps that we go to. And again, it kind of unifies us in what we're doing there. Do I have anything else? And it's just relationships. Um, we just know people. And sometimes, uh, basically, uh, a Southern Baptist pastor will most likely go to a Southern Baptist church. And then the next pastor that you get is probably going to come from a Southern Baptist church. And so in that way, even though there's no force that's holding us together, some of these experiences are what hold us together in terms of our identity and give us the texture of what it means to be Southern Baptist. Now, what I want to do before we get to questions is I want to come back and recognize that there's a little bit of a challenge in this season that some of the things that hold us together aren't nearly as prominent as they used to be. What holds us together today more than anything else is that we share our history, but not everybody knows our history. Geography is not quite as impactful as it used to be because Baptist churches have spread further and inside of these southern states there's a lot of other kinds of churches as well so that southern Baptist churches don't dominate as much as they used to in the south. Doctrine still stays the same. Uh, that, that really hasn't shifted. That re remains a unifying thing. However, you don't have to be a Southern Baptist church to believe these doctrines as well. When you draw that circle and says this is what most Baptist churches believe, there are some other faith families that come pretty close to believing some of those things. Some places there's a difference. Sometimes they stick out in one place. But there are several other kinds of churches that could be Southern Baptist except that they don't fall into the organizational structure. They don't participate in this missions. They don't have these items. But doctrinally, they could be Southern Baptist. They just have a different journey. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, our missions cooperation probably is one of the strongest things that holds Southern Baptist together today. We, we mentioned this cooperative program in 1925. We also have several one-time missions offerings that happen throughout the year. And you'll hear us talking about them every once in a while. But coming up in the springtime, uh, a little bit ahead of Easter, we have what we call the, the offering for North American missions. It's named after a woman that helped raise money for North American missions. Her name is Annie Armstrong. Uh, she lived in the 1800s, late 1800s. Uh, but we will be talking about that offering that is an over and above that all of those offerings go to North American missions. In December, we have an offering that is 100% for international missions. And usually we'll show videos that describe those uh, for us. That one's called the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, Lottie Moon was a missionary to China uh, back in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, sometimes I, this is a little controversial because it depends on whether you lean back into history. I would like us to spend more time describing them as the International Mission Board, International Missions Offering and North American Missions Offering because it's easier for everybody to understand. Um, and there's been lots of other missionaries that are out there as well. So, but, but those are offerings that we take there. But this is one of the main things that connect us as Southern Baptists. This is probably, I mean, doctrine, but not every, you don't have to be Southern Baptists to believe those doctrines. But of all the things that hold us together as a Southern Baptist church, it is this missions cooperation. Now this is the thing that's probably changing the most. 
Because there's lots of churches that don't use Lifeway Sunday School material. It's okay that they don't. It's not that they're the only people that can write a Sunday School lesson. But it means that we have a little bit less connection in that place. Baptist hymnal we don't have a Baptist hymnal. Uh, now actually Brian has a Baptist hymnal that he downloads the music from and, and so we're still actually using the Baptist hymnal because they've done a really good job of compiling music uh, for us and so sometimes you're singing out of the Baptist hymnal without knowing that you're singing out of the Baptist hymnal. Uh, but we also take music that's been written from other churches, other places and we're singing that music and so this is not unifying uh, at all. Now, that's okay, and we're going to talk about some of that next week. That's next week's thing. But so that's not as unifying. And so what happens is that today you can go on vacation, find another Southern Baptist church, and it is nothing like this church because some of these experiences aren't quite the same as what they used to be. We're not using the same curriculum. We're not using the Baptist hymnal. So sometimes people will visit our church because, oh, that's a good Southern Baptist church. But there is so much change now in what a Southern Baptist church looks like. Back in the day, there was a little bit of change from one Southern Baptist. You, you would kind of have three layers of Baptist church. You, you, you'd have a fancy Baptist church. You'd have a kind of middle of the road Baptist church. And then you'd have a real blue collar Baptist church. And that's basically the different changes that you'd have in Baptist churches. Today, the diversity of a church is much wider. A lot of times it has to do with what they're singing in terms of what the feel of that church is. But it's just not the same. Now, uh, the seminaries probably remains a pretty important thing, but even sometimes seminary is not as big of an education, is not as important as it once was. Um, the camps and the retreat centers, well, to be honest, uh, Lifeway owns and operates those, but they are trying to get people from all kinds of churches to go to those camps. And so if you go to Fuge or Center Kid or any of those camps, they, they won't use the word Baptist probably the entire week that you're there uh, because they're trying to tell you about Jesus. Not trying to make you good Baptist, but help you grow in your faith. Uh, they're, they've tried to expand what they're doing. We're going to talk about where our loyalties are supposed to be next week. Uh, so when I tell you that they're not trying to make you good Baptist, they're trying to make you good believers, we will talk about where our emotions land on some of those things next week. Um, so there is a connection. The connection probably isn't as strong as it used to be. Now some of that depends on your age. If you come from a time period where most of your growing up and in connection with church was 20 years ago and back, well, then all of these connection points are there. But the reality is they're not, almost none of these connection points are as strong as they used to be. That's just a reality. It's part of the, the complicating of the world. Uh, it just is different. Now, we're going to talk next week about what that means. I'll just say one of the things is God has not called us to be Southern Baptists. He has called us to be followers of Christ. So I value almost everything that's here. But I'm not getting to heaven on a Southern Baptist passport. I'm getting to heaven on a Jesus passport. Now, if I say much more about that, I won't have anything to talk about next week. Uh, so I'll stop because uh, i got to have material next week. Um, all right. That, that's where we are tonight uh, about the connections. I hope that includes some of this has to do with who's in charge and some of it has to do with how does an independent church that no one has authority over it, how do they stay connected? Why do they stay connected with other churches?